All right, folks, it is, uh, yeah, 1.30, okay? We're going to get started here. Um, let me make a couple quick notes, and we'll get going. So, let's make a little docs. All right, so um, we're out in the shop, and this is one of the reasons I need you guys to be here on time, and you guys are here on time, so thank you very much, because once I start work out in the shop, I don't really have access, easy access to the computer to check you in. So if you get here late, um, there's a chance that you won't even get in. So um, try to get here on time. So um, it's our second day. What do you know? How about that? Um, what we're going to talk about today is some basic terminology um, that we use in woodworking. And obviously this terminology and its actual definition can change from shop to shop or teacher to teacher, but this is what we use here. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about probably one of the simplest, but one of the most important sets of terms that you're going to run across. Okay, so let's take a look at what we have right here. All right, I have two pieces of solid stock. I have a piece of red oak, I have a piece of maple, okay? I have one piece of sheet goods, okay? We carry two different types of solid stock in this shop. In this shop. We have softwood, and we have one species of softwood, and that's pine. And we carry a one, two, five species of hardwood in here. We have maple, we have red oak, we have alder, we have cherry, and we have poplar, okay? So um, we have a varying array of material. Now, if you look at a piece of material like this, or one of these guys right here, you'll notice some different surfaces on it, okay? And these surfaces on these different boards have very distinct names or terms, things we call them by, things how we know them, okay? And, um, Probably the easiest way to go about it is just throw them at you right off the bat. Now, the only reason the face of this has kind of a different color is I put some stain on there so you can see a little bit of the grain pattern a little better, okay, because we're going to talk about that term as well. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is I don't want to use the wrong words here. Let's just call it a dimensional analysis of a board, and that's something we can measure, all right? So if I measured the surface area of this of this board on this face right here, it's going to have the largest surface area here and here, where it starts to get smaller on this surface and smaller on this surface, and there's even less surface area right here and right here, okay? So this largest surface area we're going to call the face, all right? This board has two faces. That's one face. That's the other face, okay? Same thing with this one. It's got a face and a face, okay? At this point, we get to where we kind of need to get a tape measure, you know, sometimes. The next largest surface we're gonna run across are gonna be the edges. That's gonna be this guy here and this guy here. The reason I know this is the next largest surface is because I can measure its length, all right? That's about 17 and three quarter inches. This is about three and a half inches. So these are our edges. And the last surfaces that we have remaining are our ends, okay? Now that seems pretty simple. It's like, really, Brandon, this is, really, this is what we're here for? There's a reason for this, okay? Um, when we take a look at this board right here, I want you to take a look at something first. If you'll notice the grain direction in this board is going this way, okay? In other words, when this was still part of a tree, that's how it sat, okay? All the nutrients, moisture, everything that was going from the roots in the tree up to the leaves in the tree go in this direction, okay? So that's the grain direction. On this particular board, I'm going to flip it over. There's a dark spot in the grain right there. You can see it. That's the grain direction, okay? Now, when we look at this board and we look at it dimensionally, just like we did this one, this would pretty obviously be a face. It's the largest surface on it, right? The other face, opposing faces, okay? It's pretty easy to tell that this is the next largest surface here and here. These would be the edges. And then the shortest little parts, they're the ends, okay? 
So faces, face, face, edge, 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 end, 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 end. Okay? With me so far? Haven't lost you? All right. Now let's take a look at a piece of sheet goods. Okay, this is a manufactured material. This happens to be particle board. Sheet goods are not how they naturally come out of the tree. They're made by man. This stuff in particular um, is a bunch of sawdust and tiny little wood chips that are glued and pressed under heat and pressure and makes a panel, right? Or a sheet, okay? Um, hold on, I got somebody coming in late. See, this is, this is why it bugs me because I have to stop what I'm doing. I have to stop my train of thought and try and figure out where I was before. There's another one. Okay, so this is pretty obviously a face, right? It's the largest surface we have. And this is its opposing face right here, another large surface, okay? But just by glancing at this, can you tell which would be the edges and which would be the ends, okay? Just by glancing at it, you really can't. You have to actually measure it to see that this edge is just a hair under 12 inches long. This one is a little over 12 inches. It's about 12 and a quarter inches long. So this being the longer edge, that means these are our edges, these are our ends, based on the dimensions of the board, okay? Something we can measure, something we can quantify, okay? Edges are longer than ends. Faces are larger than edges or ends, okay? So we've got two faces, two edges, two ends, all based on dimensions, okay? Tape measures rulers, things like that. So now that we know we can identify a face from an edge, from an end, we can tell the difference. Now we have to start talking about something else, okay? And that is the actual grain in a board, okay? So in this piece of oak here that's been stained, a pretty ugly stain, by the way, that's the direction of the grain, okay? The grain's going this direction. In other words, this was in the tree, just like this, this was his orientation in the tree. This little guy here, this is the grain direction, okay? This is the way it was in the tree, just like this, okay? Now, on any piece of solid stock like this, there are three distinct types of grain. There's face grain, okay? There's edge grain, and there's end grain. Okay, now when we try to determine what's edge grain, what's in grain, what's face grain, it has nothing to do with dimensions. Doesn't matter length, width, area, square footage, square inches, makes no difference whatsoever. It is the actual physical characteristics of the material that tell you whether it's in grain, edge grain, or face grain. Okay, and the reason that distinction is important is that. Every type of grain, whether it's in grain, edge grain, or face grain, is going to react differently to being cut, to going through a saw, to having a router bit clean the edge, okay? Um, it's going to react differently. In grain is notorious for splintering and tearing out when router bits and cutters exit the in grain, okay? Edge grain tends to cut a little cleaner. In grain tends to burn pretty easy. That's this guy right here. That's a burn mark from friction of the blade or the cutter, okay? The edges of certain boards tend to burn real easy. The faces, eh, not so much usually, but those are characteristics of the grain itself. Um, another thing about grain is this. If this is the way these two boards were sitting in a tree, and this is the direction that things, moisture that was gathered by the roots is transferred up to the leaves and up to the branches, okay? That means that this direction is the same as the little cellular pathways. Think of this board as a bundle of straws, okay? With the open end here and open end down here. That's the same as this board and, and the pathways that the cells take to it. All the moisture goes this direction, okay? All the moisture goes this direction. What that tells you, if I was to take a drop of water and put a drop of water right here on this end grain, okay? and take a board the same and put the same drop of water on face grain or edge grain, 
this end grain is going to suck that water up real quick. It's going to get sucked right into those cellular pathways, whereas on the face or the edge grain, it doesn't draw the water in as rapidly. Okay. There's some species of wood. In fact, I've, I've been told red oak will do it. I've never tried it. But you can actually cut a little piece of red oak, maybe six inches long and about an inch by an inch, and stick the end of it in a cup of water and blow in the other end, and it'll blow bubbles out the bottom of the oak. That, that basically would tell you it's a really open-grained wood, very porous wood, that you can actually blow bubbles through the wood in a glass of water. Try that at home sometime. Okay. Um, you'd never do that with maple. Maples are really closed grain wood, really hard, dense, closed grain wood. So we know the difference between faces, face grain, edges, ed grain, ends, end grain. Faces, edges, ends is just a dimensional analysis of a board. It's measuring a board and determining what the face is, what the edge is, what the end is. Face grain, edge grain, end grain is a physical, visible thing, structural thing in the board. Face grain is a certain type of grain. Edge grain is a certain type of grain. In grain is a certain type of grain. And all three of those guys are going to react differently when you cut it or you mill it or whatever you do to it. Okay. So that leads us to the next step in the process. Okay. So I'm going to go to the, if you have a, a cube shaped block of wood, um, that's actually a very good question. If I had a block of wood that was an exact cube, that it was three by three by three or six by six by six, um, my biggest concern would be which surfaces um, contained which grain. And I'll explain that to you here in a second. Well, let's just, let's just do it this way. Our table saw, which is this guy right here, okay? This is a fence. This is called a rip fence on the table saw. This whole thing can move left and right and alter the distance from the blade. In other words, if I put this surface of the fence six inches from this surface of the blade, then when I rip a board with it, it's gonna end up six inches wide, okay? Now, one of the rules on our table saw and on any of the machines we have in here that have a fence, table saw has a rip fence, the jointer behind me, that kind of yellowish mustard gold colored machine behind me is a jointer, it's got a fence. Our miter saws have a fence, our panel saw, has a fence, our panel router has a fence, our, our router tables have a fence, our dado saw has a fence. Anytime you have a fence on these machines, okay, the long edge of the board must be kept against the fence. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. I'll move this over to the table saw a little bit. Oh, I gotta point it out. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. And that was a good question, I'm glad you asked it. Hey, this is my long edge right here, right? That long edge has to be against the fence when I rip on the table saw. You cannot freehand cut on the table saw. The fence is there to provide control and direction of the board, okay? We cannot put the short end against the fence, okay? That is a very bad, very dangerous situation. That is called, if we cut a board this way, Cross its width, in other words, altering the overall length of the board, it's called a cross cut. If we cut a board this way, along its length, altering the overall width of the board, it's called a rip cut. This is why it's called a rip fence. If I did this, I'd be cross cutting using a rip fence. Very dangerous situation. Very bad. This is how we do it. Long edge against the fence. So if you had a block of wood, the only limiting factor that would allow you or not allow you to use a specific machine would be the minimums for that machine. In other words, minimum 12 inch length. If your cube isn't at least 12 by 12 by 12, you cannot mill it on that machine. Okay. And at that point, since all the surfaces are the same, it wouldn't matter which surface you put against the fence. Okay. So the only other consideration you'd have in a block of wood, is what grain was on what surface, what, whether you're looking at in grain, edge grain, face grain, okay? So good question. Now, all of those terms bring me to the next step. So we have three, well here, let me put this back over here. That's kind of dumb. Okay, we have three, three basic cuts or milling processes that we do in here. And I'm talking the absolute basics, okay? There's the first process we call thicknessing, okay, where we remove material from either or both faces of a board. 
In other words, what we're doing is altering the overall thickness of a board. We can take a board that's currently one inch thick, take it down to a half inch thick, a quarter inch thick, an eighth of an inch thick, whatever we want, okay? So that's by removing material from the faces, okay? There's two machines that can do that. The first machine, and also the first machine you would use on a board, is called the jointer. You can actually use the jointer to flatten one face. And you have to flatten one face before you go to the planer and remove material from the other face, okay? So the first type of milling process we do is thicknessing. And we're doing this in order as well. We will always thickness before we do any of the others. The second process we do is called ripping. And that's cutting a board in this direction. In other words, we're cutting along its length, but we're creating two skinnier boards. We're altering the overall width of a board. So in other words, I can take a board like this one that happens to be three and a half inches wide, and I can rip it to two inches wide. Okay? That's done on the table saw. That's where we do our accurate ripping to final width. Okay, we do that on the table saw. All right, um, the next step after ripping is called cross cutting. And that's that type of cut. In other words, it's cutting across the width of a board and altering the overall length, okay? So if we have a project that calls for a board that is five inches long, okay? If we start with this board that's a little over 17 and a half inches long, we can get three pieces out of this board five inches long by cross cutting. Okay, that's called a cross cut. This is a rip done on the table saw using the rip pins. This is a cross cut. We do that on the miter saw. Okay, or it's actually the, the proper term for it is sliding compound miter saw is the one that we have in here. Okay. The band saw is a whole different animal. We're not even going to talk about that yet. Um, it's the band saw um, is well, it's just, we'll talk about that at some point. That's a whole discussion in and of itself, okay? So we have three basic processes that we need to do to a board. Everything we're talking about so far is how to get a piece of raw material from the rack ready to be used in a piece of furniture. And when I say ready to be used in a piece of furniture, ready to have joinery set up in it, cut on it. In other words, we can't just take, we, in here we generally don't just take two boards and glue them together. We use some type of joinery, something to make sure that these boards are going to stay together for a long, long time. Okay, before we do any shaping, any decorative stuff, any joinery, any dovetails or box joints or dados or rabbits or all these different types of joints, um, before we do any of that stuff, we have to get the boards down to final dimensions. Now, here's a term that um, you guys need to understand, it's very important, all right? So I'm gonna ask a question in the chat window. So I'm gonna ask a question, oh gosh, it wasn't even typing here, let me try this again. This is a terrible keyboard or I'm a terrible typist. I think I'm a terrible typist. I'm not used to such a small keyboard. I got fat hands. So I'm gonna ask this question and you got about 10 or 15 seconds to answer it. And then I'm gonna put an end at the end of it. And this is to let me know if you are actually paying attention. Um, teachers now are being asked to turn the names in of students that are not um, engaged in the class. And this is one way I'm going to be able to tell. So here's your question. Okay. And this is what I'm asking the question about. Okay. Here. Okay. I'm 
I'm just recording these real quick, folks. It'll just take me a second here, okay? This is tough, man. When I don't, I don't know your faces. Um, it can be tough. It's much easier when I know your faces and everything. But it is what it is. We do what we can with what we have. Ben. So it looks like, wait, of course, there's Chandler. Brandon Chandler. You don't have any gold. Uh, Abel. And, all right. So. Here's your answer. Okay. There's no way of knowing if this board is square or not. Okay? Because when we say the word square out here, we're not talking about is this board 12 inches by 12 inches. Okay? That has nothing to do with square out here in this shop. When we say the word square, what we're concerned about is 90 degrees. Okay? There are one, two, three, four, five, six different surfaces on this piece of material right here, okay? What we're trying to do with our initial work on a board, getting it ready for use in a piece of furniture, is to get it square. That's our whole deal. We wanna get it square as well as down to final dimensions. So if we have a board that we want it to be three quarters of an inch thick, three inches wide and 12 inches long, we got to get it to that. We got to get the thickness done. We got to get the width done. We got to get the length done. But if this board isn't square, it's useless to us. Okay. And what I mean by square is that this edge is 90 degrees to this end. This edge is 90 degrees to this face. Okay. There happen to be 12 different surfaces that meet that we need 90 degrees on. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let's do it on this one right here, this will be easier, okay? So, there's 90 degrees from that face to that end, and from that face to that end, there's two more down here. Here's a 90 degree angle we need, there's another 90 degree angle we need, okay? That's four. This edge to this face, the edge to the opposite face, this edge to the face, the edge to the opposite face, there's four more, that's eight. Now we've got this end to the edge, end to the edge, end to the edge, and end to the edge. There's four more. A total of 12 different 90 degree angles that need to be dead on 90 degrees. On top of getting this to the final size that we want. Now, most of the struggles that you're going to have when you start woodworking, okay, are going to involve those two things. Getting this board square, in other words, getting all nine, all 12 of those junctions to 90 degrees and getting it to the size that's being asked for in the plans, okay? And doing it consistently over and over again. That's gonna be the biggest struggle you have in starting a class like this, a hobby like this, whatever you're doing woodworking for, that's gonna be the biggest struggles you have. So we have a very set specific procedure what if a board isn't the way it needs to be? Can we just sand it down? No, we're going to show you how to do it. We don't sand. That's, I'm glad you brought that up because that happens so much out here. It's probably one of the most annoying things I see happen out here because I tell students never to do this. During the process of getting a board square, in other words, getting all those angles 90 degrees, 
and getting it to final dimensions. In other words, getting it to that half inch thick, three inches wide, 12 inches long. We do not sand during any of those processes. Sanding has nothing to do with squaring a board or getting it to final dimensions. If I see a student trying to sand a board square or sand it to final dimensions, well, it's probably gonna depend on whether it's a Monday or a Friday, how I react. But um, most likely everybody's gonna hear about it because I say this over and over and over again. We have probably $150,000 to $200,000 worth of machines in this shop. And we have every possible way you could think of to get this board to final dimensions and get it square. So we're gonna use the most accurate, easiest to use machines to get those things done that we can. Now, another aspect of that is we want to make the fewest amount of cuts. When I say we're going to mill a board, M-I-L-L, -L, or we go through a milling process, all that is we're going to cut it with one tool machine or another, okay? Um, if we're gonna mill this to width, we're going to rip it to width on the table saw. If we're going to mill this to thickness, okay? we're going to mill it on the joiner or the planer or the drum sander. If we're going to mill this to final length, we're going to cross cut it on the miter saw, okay? So there's a really specific way in which we move through the shop from machine to machine and a very specific order in which we get this board square and down to final dimensions that we follow out here. And that's called our order of operations, okay? And the way we do it is we always do faces first, in other words, thickness. So we're gonna take care of the thickness of the board first by milling both faces. There are one, two, three, four, five, six surfaces on this board. We have to mill every single surface. There's not a single surface on this board that can go untouched, okay? So we're gonna start with thickness. And all we do, we wanna get this board from its current one inch thick down to whatever the plans call for, a half inch thick, quarter inch thick, three quarters of an inch thick, doesn't matter, whatever the plans call for. At the same time, not only do we want to get it to the right thickness, but we want to ensure that both faces, this one and this one, are parallel to each other. In other words, no matter where I measure the thickness of this board, it's going to be the same. Those two faces have to be parallel to each other. If they're not, what we have is a situation where a board's probably three inches thick down here and an inch thick down here, no good. Or it's two inches thick at this edge and a quarter of an inch thick at this edge, that's no good. Those spaces need to be parallel, it needs to be a consistent thickness. That's the first step. The next step is the width or the edges, okay? We want both edges to be flat, straight, and square to the faces, and we want both edges to be parallel to each other. In other words, no matter where I measure the width of this board, it's the same. They should be parallel to each other. If these two edges shot out into space, they'd never get closer together and they'd never diverge. That's the definition of parallel. They stay the same distance apart no matter how long those edges get. Okay, that's the second step. So we've got faces or thickness, we've got edges, the width, and our last one is the ends or the length of the board faces, then edges, then ends every single time. The whole idea of getting good at this is being consistent in the way you do things, doing things the same way every time, finding out how it works, getting good at that process and doing it the same way every time, okay? So um, faces, edges, ends, thickness, width, Link. That is what we call our order of operations. And we're going to do it the same way every time. And we're going to use the same machines every time to get them to that point. Okay. So the very first machine we would use on a board like this in order to start working the faces. Okay. Well, first of all, why would you care about working the faces? Let's take a look at the first machine we'd use. It's the jointer. We call this the jointer. Okay. So the jointer's main purpose in life actually has two main purposes. In beginning woods, it really has one. Um, you guys in beginning would not be doing any thicknessing processes. The thicknessing processes would be done for you. All you'd have to worry about were the edges and the ends, the width and the length, okay? But 
in normal circumstances in intermediate and advanced woods, the thicknessing process is the first one. What we would do is joint one face flat, okay? Now here's how a jointer works. This is called an in-feed bed, this section right here. This is called an out-feed bed, okay? So stands to reason that your board is fed from here towards the out-feed bed, okay? This red guy right here is nothing more than a guard, okay? It can be swung out of the way. It should never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, be swung out of the way when you're using it. If you ever swing this guard out of the way, while purposely swing it out of the way while you're using this machine, you're out of here, okay? So it's spring-loaded, it should pop right back, okay? Always stays over the cutter head. Underneath here, I'll try and zoom in on this so you can see it. So underneath the guard is our cutter head. This is the business end of the whole thing, okay? You can kind of see it. You see how this is kind of angled here? Well, this is called a helical cutter head, okay? These are the actual cutting edges right here. And there's row after row after row of cutters in here, okay? There's actually 54 individual solid carbide knives in here, okay? And here's how a jointer works. When you set a jointer up, Okay, what you do is you set it up. So see this, this, I'm sorry, I should have said this first. This outfeed table and this infeed table can be raised and lowered. Okay, they can go up and down. So when we set this outfeed table, what we're trying to do is set it so that the surface of the outfeed table is flush or even with the cutter head when the cutter head is at the very top of its rotation. You can see my square just kind of move there that's the top edge of the cutter head, just barely touching the surface of that square. So this surface is even with these cutter heads when they're at their apogee, when they're at the top of their rotation, okay? That's the outfeed table. The infeed table can also move up and down. And so you can see here, there's a gap of about a 16th of an inch. In other words, this infeed table is about a 16th of an inch lower than the outfeed table. That defines our depth of cut. In other words, if I set this to a 16th of an inch below the outfeed table, then every time I run a board through here, I'm gonna remove a 16th of an inch of material, okay? So that, that defines our depth of cut, all right? Now, um, little off track here, but one of the, one of the rules we have in here is um, no earbuds, no headphones, um, you're not going to be listening to music in your ears when you're out here, things like that. Um, no gloves. We don't wear gloves around rotating machinery. And there's a very specific reason for all this stuff. Once you've been out in this shop for a week and heard the machines running, you'll be able to tell just by the sound of each machine whether it's running properly or if there's something wrong. A very good example is the joiner. That's why I like to use the joiner for this is Depending on how messed up the edge of your board is, if you're jointing the edge of a board or the face of a board, doesn't matter. Depending on how messed up it is, you really don't know how many passes you're gonna have to make on the joiner to get an edge flat, straight, and square, or to get a face flat. Okay, There's, it may take you a single pass on the joiner to do it. It may take five or six passes, okay? You don't wanna take any more. You don't wanna run the board through there any more than you have to. You wanna stop when you're done. You don't want to take off more material than you have to, okay? But the, the easiest way to tell when a board you're jointing is done, it's good, you can move on to the next process, is by the sound, um, as well as by the amount of pressure it takes to feed the board through the cutter, okay? And I'm going to try and give you an example of that right now, see if you can tell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, first of all, I'm going to take a pencil, and this I don't think you'll be able to see, but we'll try. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna joint the edge of this board. For you guys, the main function of the joiner is to flatten, straighten, and square the edge of a board. And that's what we're gonna start with here. So I've taken and put pencil marks all up and down the edge of this. I don't know if you can see it. I can't see it on my screen. It's too far away and it's, it's kind of dark, okay? But, um, so what I want you to try and do is I want you to listen to the sound this joiner makes, okay? You should be able to hear when it's actually cutting 
You should be able to hear when it's not cutting. You should be able to hear when it's making a fairly heavy cut. In other words, when it's removing all the material it can out of an area, or if it's just kind of kissing the edge of the board, you know, kissing this one corner of the board that it's going through, you should be able to hear that sound. So let's see if we can hear when this board is done. In other words, when the edge has been effectively jointed, you should be able to hear. So let's try the first pass and see what we get. Okay, so can you guys hear that? Did you hear when it was cutting and when it wasn't cutting? So it cut to here, then it didn't cut here, and it cut there, okay? So let's keep listening. What you'll see is this gap, right, that hasn't been touched yet, where the pencil marks are still there, it's gonna get smaller and smaller with each pass on the joiner, and we should hear the difference in sound as well. So let's try it again. Very, very little difference in sound that time. All we've got is this little bit left, okay? So we'll run it one more time. All right. You should have been able to tell it was a nice, consistent sound along the entire length of that edge. It's done, and my pencil marks are gone as well. Actually, I recommend that you guys, when you're first starting on these machines, Go ahead and mark the surface. As a matter of fact, what I like to have my beginning classes do is before you ever start milling a board, making any cuts on a board, make pencil marks on all six surfaces. Okay? Do something like this. Take and just make a pencil mark like this on every single surface before you do anything to it. Because when you're done milling a board or squaring it and getting it to final dimensions, you should have no pencil marks left. In other words, that means you've treated every single surface on the board. All the pencil marks are gone. You're golden. It's way to go, ready to go. Okay. So hopefully you heard that. You can hear these machines. These machines make a very specific sound when they're running properly and when they're running improperly. Okay. Um, a bandsaw is a really good example. Um, bandsaws basically use. Here's a here's a messed up blade. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Bandsaws use a continuous blade. This one's messed up, so I just folded it up. But it's supposed to be, no, not, not bent like that, but just a continuous blade. And the way these things are made is there's a giant spool of this blade material, and they cut it at the length you want. For example, our 14-inch bandsaws run a 92 and a half inch long blade. So this would be 92 and a half inches worth of bandsaw blade. So they cut it, and then they tack weld it, and grind that weld smooth. And you, you can always, if you look, you can always find the little spot where they welded it. Here's, here it is right here. I, I doubt you guys can see that on the camera, but there's a little weld spot right there. Um, so a bandsaw, if you ever turn one on and, get this. if you ever turn a bandsaw on and you hear this very consistent tick, 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 tick sound, okay? What that's telling you is the bandsaw blade is cracked. It's gonna break. So if you ever turn it on, it doesn't mean when you're running it. I mean, you'll still hear it when you run it. But just when you first turn it on, you hear that tick, tick, tick sound. And it's a consistent sound. Um, that bandsaw blade is cracked. It's going to break. Turn it off. Unplug it. Get me to change the blade. Okay. Um, the table saw makes a very distinct sound when it's being run properly. Drill presses um, make a very distinct sound when it's being run properly. Our miter saw, sanders, just about anything in here is going to have a, a sound that's that it's supposed to sound like and a sound that it shouldn't sound like. Um, and that goes, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, miter saw is a good example of how fast you move the cutter through the board. Um, in other words, your feed rate um, affects the sound. Um, your sense of smell matters in here too. For example, um, if you look at this dark patch on the end of this piece of maple right here, that's a burn mark, okay? Um, that, that, that happens from a, a number of different possibilities. One is um, improper feed rate of either the board through the cutter or the cutter through the board. Um, dull blade, um, pressure coming from one side or the other. Um, but certain materials tend to burn a little more readily than others. Um, but it makes a specific smell 
Um, you, pro you guys have probably all smelled what pine smells like. I mean, Christmas trees, right? You know what a Christmas tree smells like. I mean, we're surrounded by Christmas trees, right? We know what they smell like. Um, so when people are cutting pine in here, you can, you can smell. Um, most of those other species we have in here have a distinct smell, but you won't really be able to recognize them until you've used or worked with that species of wood long enough to tell. For example, oak. To me, oak smells like somebody stepped in dog poo and tracked it through the shop. I hate the smell of oak when it's being cut. Um, walnut, a lot of people say walnut smells like chocolate when it's being cut. Um, there's another, there's two other materials. I can't remember what they were. We don't have them in here much. But one of them smells like buttered popcorn when it's being cut. Another one smells like, um, and I think it's alder that smells like um, garlic bread when it's being cut. So there's distinct, distinct smells. So your sense of hearing, your sense of touch, your sense of smell, obviously your sense of sight, um, all go to tell you how things are going, whether things are running right, running not right. You know, it, it all matters. All your senses matter. So we use them a lot in here. Um, so real quick, I want to go over what we, what we, uh, yeah, taste, I, I don't think I'd want to be, yeah, cedar, cedar is a real, a real obvious one, especially aromatic cedar, like you see line, closet linings and, and um, uh, cedar blanket chest linings and things like that. Um, so just to, just to go back over what we talked about before, there is a distinct difference between the faces, the edges, and the ends of a board compared to the face grain, the edge grain, and the end grain of a board. Okay, faces, edges, and ends refers to dimensions, something we can physically measure, right? The largest surface area we're gonna have is gonna be a face, the next largest or the longest edge is gonna be an edge, and the shortest, the smallest part is gonna be the end. Although when it comes to grain direction, the physical characteristics, the observable characteristics of a board, the way a board reacts to being cut, end grain reacts a lot differently than edge grain or face grain does, okay? So having faces, edges, and ends is totally and completely different from face grain, edge grain, and end grain, okay? Two completely different things. Next was square, okay? In this shop, square, a board being square does not mean that that is 12 inches by 12 inches. A board being square in this shop means that all 12, where all 12 surfaces meet, all 12 different angles are 90 degrees. That's what we care about. Our goal in this shop is to get every piece and part that we're going to use in furniture square and to accurate and consistent final dimensions. Okay. So square means is everything 90 degrees on the board? Okay. Dimensions is the thickness, the width, and the length. And our order of operations in this shop is thickness first. We mill the faces. Width. Next, we mow the edges. Length, last, we mow the ends. Faces, edges, ends, in that order, okay? And just right off the top, it's gonna end up being machine-wise, the joiner, then the planer, then the joiner, then the table saw, then the miter saw. Joiner gets a face flat, planer mills the opposite face, getting it to final thickness and getting to parallel faces. Back to the joiner to get an edge, flat, straight, and square. That jointed edge goes against the fence in the table saw, and it is ripped to final length. That is a rip cut, okay? That makes the opposite edge parallel to the first one and 90 degrees to the faces. Then you go to the miter saw. Every time you go to the miter saw, it will take two cuts to cut a board to final length. The very first cut you make is going to make sure that that first end is square. Then you can measure from that end you just cut Mark for your final length, cut the opposite end. That will square the opposite end, give it the final length. That's a cross cut, okay? Thickness, then width is a rip cut. Length is a cross cut. That is a ton of information in a very short amount of time. Um, we're gonna go over this in a more practical way. As, as the days go by, we'll actually walk through here and take a few boards from rough off the rack and get them squared up and get them cut to final dimensions so you can see the physical process of moving through the shop from machine to machine, how each machine is set up. Uh, we'll go over how each machine is to be used safely. Um, and this whole process is going to help us to prepare to take the safety test, which is the test that you have to pass 
uh, before you're allowed to physically work in the shop. And hopefully that day is not that far off when you guys are allowed to come back and get to work in the shop, okay? So do me a favor, get your name in the chat window for attendance. That's it for today. Thank you for being here. Please be on time tomorrow. Um, take care of yourselves tonight, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. All right, it's hump day tomorrow, halfway through the week. All right, bye, folks.